Good to see everyone. One thing we always like to do this time of the, the, the month is give out this our appreciation to Amity United Methodist Church for letting us come here and enjoy this fellowship. And since the pastor's not here, I, I was getting ready to pocket it, but Woody's here. So we, and, uh, our brother has a prayer request he'd like to share with us as well. Hello, gentlemen. I would like to make a special uh, prayer request for a lady I'd like to remain anonymous. Um, let us please ask Jesus to touch Heather's heart and teach her compassion. In Jesus' name, we ask this. Amen. Amen. Thank you. The Lord knows where that need is and how to respond to it. And not only that, to do exceeding abundantly above what we ask or even think. Well, he is risen. He is still risen. There you go. And I, I, I'm telling you, I, every Easter comes and goes quickly, and we are on to something else. We forget about it, but the resurrection is clearly something that we celebrate year-round. We live in the glory of that. Uh, I had the privilege, Sunday, to come over here to speak at uh, a, a Sunday school class at Chapel Hill Bible Church. Jim Abrahamson has a Berean class. And as I'm driving over there, ready to celebrate the, the resurrection, I, I hear on the radio that that particular day was also the transgender day of visibility or something. And so I, I mentioned that, and I got a, a ooh and a boo from the crowd. But I said, you know, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about trans eternity, how you can switch from one to the other and, and end up in the good place. So that, that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Uh, if you were here uh, during the times I shared earlier this year, I, I did a little thing on Charles Kuralt, his series On the Road, and we went through famous road trips. We went to Caesarea Philippi. We went with Philip uh, down to meet the Ethiopian eunuch in the desert. I think we even did Peter going up to Cornelius' house, and those are famous road trips. But I intentionally left one out that has to do with Easter, hoping I would get this chance, which we have this Thursday. So I'm gonna be in Luke 24 in just a moment, uh, a message that I've talked about here before. On the road to Emmaus, or as I like to entitle it, a road to Emmaus, because we're gonna find two disciples who had lost faith and were headed for a train wreck, leaving the work and the ministry of God. So let me pray for us, and then we'll take a look. Lord, thank you for another blessed opportunity to be together in the all-sufficient, life-giving, resurrected name of Jesus Christ. We wouldn't be here if that were not true. Early disciples would have failed to carry on the mission if they didn't know for certain that you had raised, been raised from the dead. So we are always living in the aftermath of Easter. Help us today to... Go back in time and walk with two people that sometimes are a lot like us. When things don't turn out like we expected, sometimes we doubt who you are. May we walk with them and rediscover our faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 24, if you were to read the first uh, dozen or so verses, is the early account of the disciples, the, the women first coming to the tomb and discovering that it was open and vacated and disbelieving that a resurrection had taken place. The women go back and report to Peter and John and the rest. It says the 11. And uh, they doubted whether the women were telling the truth or not. As you've heard before, women in the first century were never called to be witnesses in a legal proceeding because culturally they were never trusted. They were too emotional. They were too gossipy. And so the men doubted the women's account. But Peter and John had that famous race all the way to see who could get there first, and they peeked in, and they saw the res res resurrection was true. That's the first part of Luke 24. When we pick up the story here, if I can get this to pull up, we are now on the same day. Notice the scripture says, now that very day, two of them, two of the, the crowd that were assembled with the 11, Two of them were on their way to a village, and we all know that name. It's still there. It's the village of Emmaus. It's about seven miles away from Jerusalem, although last time I was in Israel, the guide said there was another Emmaus that was like 57 miles away. 
And he believed, not as a Christian, but as a Jew, that was the real one that they were traveling on. I said, well, the Bible says, as Billy Graham was often to say, seven miles. I'll go with what the Bible says. So seven miles away from Jerusalem, and by most standards, men walking in those days, that would be a half a day journey. It wasn't a straight, flat football field. It was a very arduous journey. In fact, you see it on the map. It's, it's up in the hill country. What were they doing as they walked? First of all, why were they leaving? We're going to find out in just a minute. They were talking to each other about all the things that had happened. What are all the things that had happened? If you just take the whole recent week of Palm Sunday and the celebration, the hosannas leading up to the arrest and the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus, there's a lot of talking that can be talked about. And certainly, as we'll see, they had heard reports of a resurrection. But this is the interesting part to me. While they were talking and they were debating these things, there was some disagreement about what they actually saw. Jesus himself approached and began to accompany them, and very importantly, but their eyes were kept from recognizing. Them. You know, there's another place in this area couldn't recognize Jesus immediately. He thought he was a gardener. Maybe Jesus at that point had that ability to transmogrify himself, to, to, to transform her himself. But he just walked up and started walking with them. And if you don't get anything else out of this talk today, just get the idea that when you're walking away, Jesus will walk with you, sometimes pursuing. Then he spoke. He listened for a while, then he but it in. He said, what are these matters you are discussing so intently as you walk along? And they were dumbfounded. I mean, if he's just crawling out from underneath the rock, he might not know what's been going on for the past week. And they look, they stood still looking sad. I think one translation says downcast. Then one of them named Cleopas the other one will never be named. I don't know if I want my name associated with this story, but Cleopas is forever preserved. He answers Jesus and says, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there these days? Be careful that you don't insult Jesus as being ignorant. He did. And Jesus plays along. What things? He's drawing them out. By the way, again, if you're ever walking away, You'll get inquisition from somebody or some supernatural being that will say, what's your problem? What are you dealing with? And they keep drawing you out so you can hear yourself say what you need to say. Notice what they did say. Cleopas speaking for the two of them. He says, the things concerning Jesus, the Nazarene. Notice the description he's about to give Jesus, the man that they had probably spent the better part of a year or two or maybe three years with. And this is the conclusion that they had formed right up until that very day. Jesus the Nazarene, so someone from Nazareth, a man who with his powerful deeds and words, give him credit for that, proved to be a prophet, just a prophet. You ask people today, who is Jesus? Some might even grant him that. He's a very wise, wonderful prophet. He was approved to be a prophet before God and all the people and how our chief priests and rulers handed him over to, the, to be condemned to death and crucified. They got part of the story right so far. But here's where they went askew. But we had hoped. Here's what they had hoped for. This was their conclusion of what Jesus was going to do for them. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now, that's code, obviously. If you lived in the first century, that made perfect sense. They were under the thumb and the rule of the Roman Empire. They were under the scrutiny of the Pharisees and all the oppressing forces. And so the Messiah was believed to come along, and he was going to be the military victor over all those things, in addition to being the savior of the world. And indeed, he will one day be that way, but it's, it's two different comings. The first coming is Bethlehem, meek and mild, riding on a colt, Jesus. But boy, you don't want to be on the bad side when Jesus comes a second time riding that white charger uh, with breathing out fire and, and taking vengeance on those who oppressed him. But it, they had them combined. They had Jesus doing the first and second coming all at once and therefore redeem Israel and 
put kick out Rome and put everything back where it was so that they were enjoying the glory days of like when David was on the throne. We had hope that Jesus would do this. And don't be too hard on them. I make that mistake. You make that mistake. We have expectations of what Jesus ought to do. We pray, Jesus, we want you to do this now. We make very specific prayer requests, which I encourage every one of us to do, as long as we hold those loosely, realizing, as we've said here before, Jesus can answer that one of four ways. Yes, no, wait, or I got a better idea. We had hoped that he was going to redeem Israel. Not only this, but it's now the third day since these things happen. And furthermore, and these are guys who are in the room earlier in the day when the women showed up. Some of the women of our group amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find the body, they came back and they said, not that they believed it, they said they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. I find that pretty convincing proof. I've got skeptic friends today who would say, if I could have seen those things, I would be a believer to this day. Said he was alive. And then they say some of those who were with us, Peter and John, went to the tomb, and they found it just as the women had said. But they did not see him. And that's as far as they went. They, they had hoped he would be the redeemer of Israel. They had heard the report of resurrection. They just didn't buy into it. So what does Jesus do next? He speaks. What does he say? Well, good job. You got most of the Sunday school lesson right. Thank you for your attention. We can work with that. You understand Jesus had not read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Because out of his mouth come these words, you foolish people. Sometimes we don't think of Jesus as being bold and confrontive. And he's just walking along with two disillusioned, despondent disciples who are heading back home saying, we put all our money on one horse and it didn't win. And he calls them foolish. I take that personally. Sometimes when, when I make Jesus out to be something that I want him to be and he doesn't turn out to dance to my music, I'm being foolish. That's an appropriate adjective in my life. You foolish people. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Notice he refers to himself in the third person. He still hasn't revealed who he is. It was necessary. If you don't know anything about the cross, just know that it's necessary. There's no way for you not even be here if, it's, if it weren't for the cross. It's necessary for the Savior to suffer and enter his glory. And then what happened in the next hour or so, I don't know how long it was, was what I call the most amazing Bible study on planet Earth. Now, I love Stephen Crotz and Rick and, and other teachers we get the privilege to listen to. And you may have your favorite pastors and Bible teachers that you can watch online or in person. But I won't video replay of this one when we get to heaven. What does Jesus do? He still hasn't revealed who he is. Beginning with Moses, that would be the first five books of the Bible. And the prophets is reference to the rest of the Old Testament. He took each one of those books and he interpreted to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. I lead Bible studies, as does Rick and other people. And a lot of people don't like study the Old Testament. They like stay in the New Testament. That's about Jesus, right? But Jesus is in the Old Testament. <laughs> I had a professor one time at the cemetery who uh, didn't believe that. And uh, the first day of class, he said, and he did this every, every year with every group of students. He said, there's one thing that will result in this Old Testament survey course that will result in your automatic failure, failure and that is if you refer to Jesus in the Old Testament. And years before I took the class, there was a young Pentecostal student. He was in the wrong place. He, was, he raised his hand at that announcement and said, but Brother Bailey, that was the name of the professor. He'd never been called that before, by the way. Brother Bailey, Jesus is in all of the Old Testament. 
And the professor struck back. He said, no, sir, what you're saying is a matter of faith, not fact. What's referred to in the Old Testament is the Messiah is referred to in the Old Testament. Pentecostal kid looked around and said, but Brother Bailey, Jesus was the Messiah. And again, the professor came back and said, but that's a matter of faith, not fact. Some people don't believe he was the Messiah. The good news at the end of that story is that guy left the class, never sat back down, went to the admissions office and resigned and went to another seminary. If this is the way we're starting it out for my four years. I don't want to go any further. Just imagine Jesus taking every book of the Old Testament and talking about himself. I wonder what that would have sounded like. Used to have this committed to memory, but I, I, I have a better forgetter than a good memory now. So here we go. Perhaps Jesus said, you know, guys, there's this opening book called the book of Genesis. Messiah in that book is the seed of the woman. And then there's Exodus where he's referred to as the Passover lamb. And Leviticus, the great high priest, and Numbers, the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day, and Deuteronomy, the prophet like unto Moses. Then you get into Joshua, we see the appearance of the commander of the Lord's army and judges, the judge and lawgiver, and Ruth, the kinsman redeemer, and Samuel, the trusted prophet, and Kings, the reigning king, and Ezra. He's like the faithful scribe, and Nehemiah, the rebuilder of the broken down walls of our life. And Esther, he's our Mordecai, and Job, he's the one who laid the foundations of the world. In Psalms, he's like the great shepherd, our Lord, our shepherd. In Proverbs, he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Ecclesiastes, he's our wisdom. In Song of Solomon, the bridegroom. Isaiah, the prince of peace. Jeremiah, the righteous brand. You get to Lamentations, he's often the weeping prophet. Ezekiel, he's the original stairway to heaven. Daniel, the fourth man in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Hosea, the faithful husband, Joel, the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. Amos, he's the repair of the broken down. And Obadiah, the mighty one to save. Jonah, he's like a great foreign missionary when he left heaven. Micah, he's the messenger with the gospel. Nahum, he's the avenger of God's elect. Habakkuk, he's God's evangelist, shouting, revive thy work in the midst of the years. And Zephaniah, the savior, Haggai, the restorer, and Zechariah, the cleansing fountain. Now, that didn't take long. Imagine Jesus elaborating every one of the 39 Old Testament books. I believe I'd be a believer by the time he got to the end of that message. Well, what happened at the end of that? Oh, we forgot Malachi, the Italian prophet, uh, the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. So they keep walking and Jesus keeps talking and they approach the village where they were going. And Jesus was going for an Emmy at this point. He acted as though he wanted to go farther. But they urged him. He was baiting him on. Stay with us. Man, wouldn't you want this man to stay with you after what you just heard? Because it's getting toward evening and the day is almost done. Remember that. You don't travel after sundown in that part of the world. You didn't have good lighting. That's going to come into play in just a moment. So Jesus said, okay, he went in to stay with them. And then what happened when he had taken his place at the table with them, he did something completely out of order. The host of the home did this next part. You never did this as a guest unless you're Jesus. He took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and then he gave it to them. Ding, 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 ding. Alarms are going off in the minds of these two who had seen this before. And at this point, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he vanished out of their sight. Mission accomplished. I've done my work here. <laughs> They're sitting there. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us when he was speaking with us on the road? In that 39 book Bible study, he just taken him through. While he was explaining the scripture to us. Let me back up. They might have said at that point, you know what? It's been a long day. We've traveled and we've seen, heard, and lost stuff. Let's get up tomorrow morning and go back to Jerusalem. It's dark, right? Got our excuses already made. They don't say that. They got up that very hour and they returned to Jerusalem, risking even the peril of a nighttime walk. And they found the 11 and those who were gathered together and said, <laughs> not that the Lord is risen. What did they say? He's really risen. And he's appeared to Simon, the one who betrayed him or ran from him. 
Then they told what had happened on the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. So I always try to say, this is a good message on the Emmaus road or eroding faith. When life disappoints, we've been together a long time, gentlemen. A lot lot of our stories have been told. Many of them we don't know, but you and I bump, bump up against a disappointment on a regular basis. And sometimes it's because Jesus or God doesn't do exactly what we think he should do, like these guys. So I take away two things from this story that I need for the next time when life really disappoints. The first one is I need to remember his presence because he's here. They didn't know he was there. They had walked a few miles and didn't realize he was with them. And then he shows up and they still didn't realize he was with them. And when I'm in the most disappointing eroding of my faith, I need to stop for just a moment and say, there's a thing called omnipresence. He is never going to leave. me. He made that promise over and over again. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The Old Testament Psalm says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, not far away. He's close. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. He's here. When life disappoints. I put it together for my sake, my, my memory's sake uh, a while back by saying it this way. You may feel abandoned, but you've been adopted. You may feel forsaken, but you have actually been chosen. You may feel lost, but you're loved. You may feel segregated from others, but you are celebrated by him. You may feel defeated with care, but you're dis- you're seated with Christ. You may feel slighted by people, but you're surrounded by his presence. You may feel denied by those who don't even really know you, but you are desired by the one who knows everything about you, warts and all. You may feel ignored by men, but you're invited by the master. You may feel left out of a crowd, but you are sought out by the king. You may feel unworthy of a single friend, but you, my friend, have been made worthy of his sovereign fellowship. Yeah, you may feel lonely. I do. But you are never, ever alone. You may not recognize it any more than those two men recognized his presence, but he was right there in talking distance. So, by the way, he's always in talking distance. So that's my first takeaway from this. Remember that his presence is promised and delivered. He's always here. The second thing is I need to rediscover his purpose. See, they had a purpose for Jesus. What was his purpose going to be? He was going to be the one that kicked Rome out. He was going to be a redeemer politically. That was the only purpose they were interested in. That was the end game for when the Messiah came. That's all they wanted. But they had to rediscover what his true purpose was. And 39 books later, they understood. He's always more than you and I think. Have you discovered that? Have you learned that you haven't learned it all yet? Are you in process to realize there's still more about Jesus I need to know? What if Jesus had the New Testament? which would be written later, what would he have said about himself in those 27 books? Well, Matthew, he's the Messiah. Mark, he's the wonder worker. Luke, he's the son of man. John, he's the son of God. Acts, he is the ascending Lord. Romans, he becomes the justifier. In Corinthians, he's the resurrection and the life. Galatians, he's the redeemer from the curse of the law. Ephesians, he's the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Ephesians, we learn that he's the God who supplies our needs according to his riches and glory. Colossians, he's the Godhead bodily. And 1 and 2 Thessalonians, he's the soon-coming king. And Timothy, he's the only mediator between God and man. And Titus, he's the faithful pastor. Philemon, the liberator of those in bondage. Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. And James, he's the great physician. Peter, he's the chief shepherd of our souls. 1 and 2, 3 John, he's everlasting love. And in Jude, 
Oh, he's the Lord coming one day with 10,000 of his saints. And when we get to that last book, he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning of the end, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Somebody ought to at least think amen. <laughs> he's always more, isn't he? Part of, part of the lifelong journey that you and I are on, longer than a seven road mile to Emmaus, is to figure out more and more who this man Jesus is. And just when you think you've got it all figured out, he takes us one book further and shows us another facet of his glory and his might and his intention for you and for me. So even when life disappoints, as it did for these two, Jesus makes his way secretly into their presence, cloak and dagger, ask a few questions, draws them out, as he will you and me. And then finally, with gentle scolding, Maybe even call me foolish, and that's okay. Only Jesus is allowed to do that. He takes me to the place where I learned that he hasn't left me, he hasn't forsaken me. I can remember that his presence is promised and delivered. He's always here. Can you remember that? In the next disappointment that you face. And then secondly, continue the journey with him to rediscover his purpose. There's more about Jesus than you and I will ever understand. I'll be the guy, you'll see me in heaven with a flat forehead. I've mentioned this before. But now we see everything face to face. We'll be doing this forever, all throughout eternity. Oh, now that makes sense. That's the Jesus I never fully understood. I like that road trip. It started out pretty bad. These were two guys headed home. They'd wasted all their time and energy on this one man. And by the end of the day, they're so excited. They're like on 10 Red Bulls and four cups of coffee. They can't wait to get to Jerusalem and tell people he's really risen. We've seen him. We've talked to him. And oh, by the way, go tell Peter, who's still soaking his sorrows. I don't know what your next disappointment will be. It could be relational. It could be financial. It could be economic in ways that affect all of us. It could be sin on all kinds of levels. But when you're in that moment and you're walking away, hear footsteps behind you of the one Jesus who's not going to leave or forsake you, even in that moment, but he's going to find a way to engage you, ask some questions, get your attention, Reveal himself in something familiar like the breaking of bread and let you know, I haven't left you. I've got more to show you. Father, we are so grateful that Easter doesn't end this particular past weekend. The resurrection reality continues 52 weeks of the year. And it just reminds us in this story that even after all the evidence that you are alive, some will doubt. We, among many people meeting in groups in Chapel Hill, have more evidence than anybody from our consistent study of the scripture. And yet, we can play the role of Cleopas, and we can forget, and we can walk away. So we welcome your attention. We welcome you joining my conversation. We welcome you coming and revealing yourself to bring us back. We've strayed, but you haven't left us. So teach us that you're here and teach us that you're always more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, maybe that reminds you of a time in your life when life disappointed and Jesus came through. I'd be just delighted if someone had the boldness to share any of those kinds of moments and memories. Uh, I think uh, Eric's already raised his hand in Michigan. Eric, what are you thinking? Well, you know, <clears throat> it was magnificent um, to be reminded of salvation. Um, <clears throat> you know, Easter originated as a pagan holiday of fertility, and it was brought upon with changing names and through history. But to me, it doesn't matter because when Easter is mentioned, it's for the children. It's for us to be reminded of salvation. 
and the death of Jesus. Um, we learn so many things as we go along. You were saying that uh, you can become lonely. I don't understand loneliness. When you have Jesus, you can never be lonely. Um, he's there for us in all needs. Um, and when you have a God mindset, it's so much easier. But when you have a common God sent, it's not. So you have to really dig into the Lord because he is all great. We're of human knowledge and wisdom, and we seek a lifetime to learn more of God's universal knowledge, way beyond our human knowledge. And that's what we can't overthink God. He's way beyond what we're ever thinking. Be worthy of Jesus. Love him and follow him into eternity. Jesus, Jesus was sent to us as a human of example. And it's our obligation when we decide to follow Jesus to be of great example of him. We can't be pure, but we can come as close as we can of good example to win others to eternity and salvation. Um, the scripture is wonderful. The Bible is wonderful. There's not a book written that's as powerful as the Holy Bible. But if you follow it, many people follow it from time to time. It's our duty to, you know, I, I was sent a scripture today um, from somebody because I have cancer and I canceled cancel. I took the R off and put an L in there, but I've canceled it. I'll go through the preparations to make sure, but it's important that my faith and my strength is all that I need to live my life in Jesus. He will get me through anything. And it's so important of where you put your faith into. Um, George Huston. Whoops. So <laughs> a phone call of all times. So, you know, I'm very, very into running for Jesus. I don't walk for Jesus. I run for Jesus in my stewardship to him. Um, and it's so important. And, you know, I just turned 80 years old. And I put so many people to shame, but I shouldn't. Everybody should give all they have towards Jesus. No excuses of sin. Sin is something you fabricate and comes along. But if you change that, I always call it the big, attack, big Mac attack, positive, negativity, and you have to reinforce it with positivity. Sin is negativity. I take it from my, my whole being. I know that we're born of sin, and we're always going to be around sin. But if you have positivity and love that Jesus is in our life, there's no sin. Um, we can talk about it to prevent others from sinning, but we have to be of example to show others that we are not following sin. We're following Almighty. Uh, amen. Thank you, Eric. Every time I hear you speak, and now that you've mentioned your 80, it reminds me of a character in the Old Testament, Caleb, one of the 12 spies who went and scouted out the land, came back and gave the good report to the children of Israel that we're more than able to overcome the giants of the land. Of course, what happened to 10 other spies gave a negative report. The giants were mightier. We can't win. So they wander 40 years, finally get into the promised land. And now, how old is Caleb? He's 80 or maybe 82. And he goes to Joshua and he says, remember that hill that I wanted to take back 40 years ago? Give me that land. I'm more than able at this age to take it. That's what Eric's like. He, age isn't going to be an issue. I'm going to take back that land for Christ. So thank you, Eric. Yes. Well, I think uh, God, the glory the coach told uh, Danny Lotz that you're going to you're going to tackle the giant and we're going to win the national championship. So he had to defend Wilt the stilt. So he took the land. If, uh, excuse me, I got a friend of mine. I played football with at North Dakota state my freshman year. I lasted one year in Fargo, but the bonds that I have with some of my old teammates is pretty strong. And, uh, one of my old teammates, I, did wish him a happy Easter, and he sent me back a text message. He said, uh, 
Happy Easter. I'm recovering from a long medical issue. Um, and I've been in the hospital since January 1st. There was an, until the second week, he was there from January till the second week of March. And I, I am low. I am now in a skilled uh, nursing care facility, learning to do everything all over again and uh, talk to you soon. He says, go Bison. His name is Brian Johansson. Uh, we played football together at North Dakota State. Um, and it really hit me when I heard that. So if everybody's prayers could go out to Brian J in Fargo, North Dakota, um, it's, I, I just felt for him and, uh, and there's some very powerful people in here and we got our heavenly father above and, um, thank you very much. Father, thank you for Brian, wherever he is. And you, you see that clearly from your vantage point, already prayers have ascended to urge you to that. We, we come in agreement as a bunch of men that you as his great physician will visit him. You'll work through the natural process of doctors and medicine, but you'll also work through the supernatural to bring about a healing in his life. So we pray that we call it done in the name of Christ. Amen. Did somebody else just pop up there? Yeah, Eric, did you have something else? Yes, I did. Um, you know, I am from Michigan. Um, I'm not familiar with Danny Lotz, but I love him. Um, he's a man of God. Um, and everything I hear, he's magnificent. But you know, there's many Danny Lotzes around this world. In every state, there's a band of brothers in every state. There's Bible studies in every state. And Danny was your man that came out with the truth. But we can't forget the other men that are doing the same. We can't just zero in on Danny Lotz. We have to zero in on the universe about the United States. We must pass on Danny Lotz's knowledge and his ability to do what he did to teach others to do the same. Um, I'm a teacher. I'm a mentor, but I wish I had met Danny Lotz to share my beliefs because all of us that are devoted have that type of um, belief. And he impressed people because of what? He had great example. And I, I just honor him. And I honor you people for having respect for him and recognizing that he brought the Lord to you always amen yeah you're gonna to get to meet him yeah we'll all get to know each other again <laughs> you know i've always laughed uh, with the pastor who gave the image one time we were sitting in a small group circle la trying to describe from images like the book of revelation and others what heaven would be like and this one guy just spoke up he said ha we're gonna all be up there in a circle in heaven and we'll be laughing about what we used to think <laughs> but it's gonna be all good when christians never say goodbye we just say until then amen. right honey yeah, I wanted to um, ask for prayers, too, for our brother, Roger Shoemate. Roger was in the hospital several days and um, now at home, um, but um, he's under taking antibiotics, um, hoping to avoid um, surgery. So he has kind of meal issues. So prayers for our brother, Roger. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to share that um, the Road to Emmaus story is one of my favorite stories in in the Bible, and um, and and whenever you see somebody do a video or pictures, like you had a picture of him walking along, he's got the robe and the hood and and all. And um, as as I thought about what that would be like, exactly like you said. Um, I'm actually hoping that rather than just the video, that somehow God can supernaturally take us back and we actually can watch it happen. That would be great. Um, but, but the one thing that I thought about is that, you know, it goes along, um, by the way, there's, this is a gal that sings this song she wrote called didn't our hearts burn within us. It's just unbelievable. Uh, I'll have to share that with the group sometime, but, um, uh, 
and he's talking to these people and their their chest, their hearts burning within them with the truth just is hitting them and pounding them. You know, you can just imagine getting zinged by it all. And, you know, they're, they're just begging him to come. And, and then he sits down and he takes the bread and he breaks it. And when he extends it, his arm comes out to hand him the bread. There's a hole in the wrist and they're, Oh my God, you know, the hood has come back. He, they start to see. And as they're looking at him, you know, he just, bam. but you know, just that moment of, of realization didn't our hearts burn. Wow. Yeah. Let me, let me add one quick story there. That it's one of my favorite true stories about that term. Back when I was in college, we had a Bible study in a guy's house in Greensboro where I grew up in the summer. And uh, four Christian men lived in that house and uh, welcomed this Bible study every Sunday night. Well, it was an area of high Mormon missionary activity, and they learned that this is a house where a lot of young people meet. And if they could convert the leader, this guy's name was Hank, then boy, what they could they'd see the dominoes fall. So they started coming to see him. And unlike some of us that shut the door and turned them away, Hank said, no, if I occupy their time, they can't go up and down my street. So he met with them for six months. There was an elder Jones and an elder Smith, let's say, I don't know their name, but the young guy was the trainee, elder Smith, and there was elder Jones. And it came down to the point where they started giving him the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines and Creeds, their staple books, and asked him to read them. And they said, when you read it, God will give you the burning in the bosom. That's their term to confirm this is true. Only the next week when they came by to visit, they never asked him if he received the burning of the bosom. He just, they just assumed if he didn't say anything, he didn't. So after six months, they say, are you ready to join the church now? Join the stake of the Mormon church. And he thought about it. He said, well, yeah, I'll go along with that although he wasn't going to join. So he describes the night. It was wonderful. They had several other missionaries present their candidates, and they were voted by the church and accepted, and they became Mormons. Hank is sitting there with his two buddies, and they call him up to give his testimony. And as opposed to answering set questions, like we do sometimes when we invite somebody into a church, Hank raised his hand. He said, can I just say a word of appreciation for Elder Jones and Elder Smith? They have been wonderful. They have come and spent countless hours with me describing what you all believe. And not only that, they've given me at no expense all the sacred books that you guys believe in. And they told me that if I would pray as I read those books, God would give me the burning of the bosom and confirm that they were true. So I am here tonight to tell you, I prayed every time I read those books and God gave me the burning of the bosom that they were not true. <laughs> he looked up in the corner. Elder Smith is slinking down on the wall, defeated. And he said a few more words, and he saw the ushers coming forward, so he got out of there. But that isn't that true. You've experienced, when you read scriptures on your own sometimes, or heard a speaker or a sermon, there is that experience that's only described by the burning the confirmation that God is giving. And likewise, as my friend demonstrated, you can read falsehood and you get another heartburn of the heart uh, to prove it's not true. Someone else got a story or a question. All right. Well, may your Emmaus road not be a mess. And may the next time you find yourself out there disappointed, you remember those two truths. He is always here and he's always more. Father, thank you for the privilege of gathering in your name and now going out in your name into whatever challenge lays ahead of us on this rest of Thursday, Friday, and the weekend. And for the rest of our life, as we find life coming at us fast and sometimes changing in our face and things go 90 degrees to what we thought, May the story of the road to Emmaus remind us of your unmistakable presence and that your power is always more than we think. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.